This is Glenn Healy. Hi, this is Braden Holpe. This is Daryl Sutter. Hi, this is Brian Burke. This is Jordan Tutu. This is Keith Morrison. This is Kelly Rudy. Hi, this is Scott Hartnell. Hey, everybody. My name is Steel Fleury. This is Tim McAuliffe of Sportsnet, and you're listening to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Happy Monday. We are, uh, oh man, I'm fired up. We are, we are like four days away now from from biking to Tufnell, Saskatchewan. It is coming awfully quick, and uh, we're doing our, our darndest to uh, to make some uh, you know some money for the local breakfast programs here in Lloyd Minster. And uh, it being Monday, you should probably check out social media because there's some there's some big news coming here uh, this morning. And uh, oh man, I'm just I don't know. I'm excited. Four days, four and a half days, and all of a sudden we're on the road and uh, one pedal a push at a time all the way to Tufnell, Mr. Quick Dick, and then all the way back. So hopefully, God willing, the weather uh, holds out for us, gives us a great tailwind, and and on the way back, sun shines on us, and, and away we go. Now, that isn't what we're here to talk about today. We got we got a cool one today. Mr. Twos is in the house. So, but before we get there, of course, let's get to our episode sponsors, Carly Kloss and the team over at Windsor Plywood Builders of the podcast studio table. For everything wood, these are the guys. Deck season, of course, is upon us. We had a glorious weekend, and it looks to be hot this week. And they're all stocked up on their Windsor uh, micro sienna brown treated lumber so if you got a backyard project on the go stop in and see the group at windsor plywood or just hop on your phone take a look at their instagram page and do a little creeping creep in and uh, whether we're talking about mantles decks windows doors or sheds give the team a call 780-875-9663 uh t-bar one transport since 2002 for more than 19 years from the team at T-Bar has offered excellent service, putting the community first. They're, bo- they're located both at not only Lloyd Minster and, of course, Bonneville now. They can cover all your heavy haul needs. Uh, their fleet uh, has 45-ton pickers, one tons flat decks, Texas bed, winch truck, highway tractors, and uh, the boys are ready for your call. Anything you got, heavy haul needs, give the boys at T-Bar one a call, 780-205-1709. And if you see us on our way this weekend, uh, sporting a T-Bar one uh pilot truck give us a wave or a honk jen gilbert and team for over 45 years since 1976 the dedicated realtors of coldwell banker cityside realty have served lloyd minster and the surrounding area they offer star power providing their clients with seven day a week access they know service is a priority because well big life decisions aren't made during office hours i gotta thank coldwell banker again for their donation to bike for breakfast And this is Coldwell Banker, Cityside Realty, for everything real estate, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Give them a call, 780-875-3343. If you're looking for a mortgage broker, look no further than Jill Fisher. Now, obviously, that name says it all. She proudly serves the areas of Lloydminster, Bonneville, Cold Lake, Vermilion, and uh, she looks forward to working with you for all your mortgage needs. And let's be clear, this guy doesn't know... jack squat about anything to do with with mortgages all i know is they're low there's opportunity there and if you are uh, thinking well gee we we're coming up on a mortgage or maybe you want to take a look at your current one give her a call 780-872-2914 or visit jfisher.ca she'll help you out with all your questions clay smiley and the team over profit river they specialize in importing firearms from the united states of america they pride themselves in making the process easy for all their customers the team at profit river does all the appropriate paperwork on both sides of the border in order to legally get that firearm into canada and into your hands and let's be honest the headache of dealing with the border right now (laughs) just make it easy on yourself they take care of registering the firearm and transferring it to your PAL or FAC uh, before shipping them by mail, courier, or bus to wherever you are. All right, just go to ProfitRiver.com and check them out today. They are the major retailer of firearms, optics, and accessories, and they serve all of Canada. The SMP billboard across from, uh, well, down by the uh, airport now. Uh, if you're looking to get a little outdoor signage, maybe give Read and Write a call, ask for the Mrs. Deanna Wandler, she's amazing, 306-825-5111. And finally, Gartner Management is a Lloydminster-based company specializing in all types of rental properties to help meet your needs. Whether you're looking for a small office or a 6,000 square square foot commercial space, give Wade Gartner a call, 780-808-5025. And if you're heading into any of these businesses, please let them know you heard about them from the podcast, right? Now let's get on to that T-Bar 1 tale of the tape.
He'd like his identity to remain anonymous. He goes by twos, triple two, 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 222, 111 times two. You get the point. Buckle up. Here we go. This is 222 Minutes, and you're listening to the Sean Newman Podcast. Well, welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Triple Two, uh, the, the Triple Deuce, uh, 222, 222. Yep. I, I, don't, I don't know. Is that, is that good enough? Any and all of it's good enough. 222 minutes on Twitter. And then the podcast is my 222 cents. Just throw in a bunch of twos and I'll know who you're talking about. That's right. Well, I, I should uh, I should point out, I think it was I think it was Quick Dick that put me on to you um, okay. way back when. And I started following you and I don't know. I was telling a bunch of people um, uh, earlier today while we were doing this bike for breakfast uh, thing at Three Trees here in town. Um, I was, my, my mouth was running away with me because I listened to you all day long and I'm like, he's got some colorful language, but more times than not, he has me like cracking up. And that's not an easy thing to do. Normally I'm pretty like serious when I drive by myself. Mm -hmm. And a couple of times you caught me off guard and you have me chuckling like, man, that was, that was pretty clever. I'm not going to lie. So if you haven't checked out, uh, 222 minutes, you should. Thanks, man. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, cheers to that. Cheers, buddy. Yeah, it kind of just came out of nowhere. Well, I don't know if it came out of nowhere. Little infant versions of it had been popping up a little bit here and there. Like I lived in Saskatoon for a few years and I used to write uh, I used to write articles for the Sheaf, despite the fact that I didn't go to the U of S. So I was just submitting them and then they were printing them and I thought, okay, well, this was awesome. And then actually it was kind of funny. I was at a house party one time with a bunch of people and I kind of mentioned it and they're like, no, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I write for the sheaf. Like, no, you don't. And then it turned out they all did. And when I told them who I was, they're like, Oh my God. And then one of the guys had this website that I ended up writing a bunch of movie reviews for. And I mean, this was way back in the day. So I did like love actually and Spider-Man two and stuff like that. I would and love to read your review of Spider-Man two. <laughs> I hated it. Honestly, and I love comic book movies. And then I had a blog for a little while that was just sort of random thoughts about this and that and whatever else and interesting things that happened in my life because interesting stuff seems to happen to me sometimes. And then that kind of just got to be a little bit too much. And then I was on Facebook and I would just write really ranty posts about what I thought about the government and what was going on with it and stuff like that. And... Like I had people who were just like, I don't know you, but I've heard that you'd be a great person to be friends with because you have interesting stuff to say. But then as my pro professional side of my life was evolving, I decided to just totally close that account because I didn't want someone just looking me up and being like, oh, they might not be a good culture fit. And then I kind of had this unused energy and a mostly dormant Twitter account that followed 22 minutes. And every time I saw them, they were doing something dumb or weak really watered down. And I kept on saying, I was like, I can do a better job than these guys like off the top of my head. And then one day I was like, screw it. I will. And so I started this new account. And then nine days later was when the liberals went to Twitter and got them to shut down that Catherine McKenna parody account. That was so good at sounding like an idiot that everybody thought it was real. And it really blew up when Brett Wilson retweeted something that the parody account had said that sounded like something she would say, but maybe a little bit funnier and dumber. That was a really good parody account. And it was so a then great sudden, pair. Everybody yeah. knows that account. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all these parody accounts blew up out of nowhere and it was just perfect, right place, right time kind of thing. And it's just kind of blown up from there. And then some people were asking, hey, have you ever thought about doing a podcast? And I was like, well, I mean, I thought about doing a YouTube video and uh, I talked to a few people about just ghostwriting for them because I didn't want to put my face on it and nobody seemed really that interested. And I thought, okay, well, you know what? I could do some kind of a podcast. And here we are. I've done 13 episodes so far. It's and it, fun. I'll pump your tires a bit more. Like they're fantastic. Like um, 
it's very politics is not an easy thing for like most people want to turn their brain off, right? Like they just, Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting to watch society in like this time where, I don't know, like whether you want to turn politics off or not, it's, it's sitting right in front of you. Like everything that's wrong with the country is just sitting right for everybody to see. And people still just want to like close their eyes and turn off their ears and, and not pay attention to it. And now it'll fix itself. And uh, what's wonderful about how you break down things is colorful language is always um, something that just kind of like is unusual, right? Because if you're 22 minutes, you don't get to do that, right? You just don't. And uh, if my mother looks you up, uh, earmuffs, mom, you're probably not going to like it. So maybe, (laughs) maybe don't go there. But at the same time, you might, because it just kind of paints the picture of like, this is stupid. Like, why are we doing this? And why do they get away with it? Mm Mm-hmm but you're really well thought out. I like how you, uh, it makes a little bit of sense hearing a little bit of your story on what you used to do, because I'm like, man, for a guy to just kind of pick this up and go with it right from the beginning, like you, your episode one, isn't like, Oh, that was rough. It was like, oh, that was pretty good. And by 13, I think, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, on the phone that, uh, you were, you were worried about being perfect. And, uh, I don't know, man, at times it feels pretty damn close to perfect to me. I don't know. Well, I appreciate that. I've definitely been getting a lot better. I actually went back and listened to one of the old episodes uh, because of something somebody brought up that I just kind of wanted to touch base on in case case it came up tonight. And I felt like it was almost unlistenable, right? But I've really been, and this is what I what what, what did you What did you you go back and listen to? What was the thing that was bothering you? Oh, well, just, just my tempo, my delivery. I was like, man, this is just so bad like i kind of want to just go back and delete them or redo them or something like that just because i've gotten that much better just in this short amount of time right but i mean even when i'm doing the recording and stuff like that it'll take me like five hours to do the last minute edits and and do a whole bunch of takes until i've got something sounding close to what i want and then to cut it all together too right well see that's what i that's what i envy about you and even quick dick right is you guys are trying to like hone this like certain amount of, for quick dick, it's anywhere between what three and nine minutes. I, I would be safe yeah. to say. And you're closer to what 22 to 25 minutes, somewhere in that range. Yeah. Ballpark. I am for 20 minutes. And then I always kind of end up seeming to go over a little bit. Cause at the last minute I'm like, Ooh, I can make this joke or, Oh, I could throw that in and then I'll record it and upload it. And then six hours later, I'll be like, Oh, I left a joke on the cutting room table. Like uh, last episode I did, I talked about the city of Calgary and this stupid law they have that says that the electronic scooters in town have to have Braille on them (laughs) and how the city council was just full of dumb people. And that's not entirely fair. There's one guy actually that's really good, but the rest of them are just throwaway garbage. And, And then the next day I was like, the blind leading the blind. Oh God, that would have been perfect. And so, I mean, there's always stuff like that that you think about afterwards. And... Well, that's that's one thing I admire about you guys because you you you're trying to perfect your craft. Where for me, man, they're gonna hear it all. I I that's mm-hmm. one thing I hate about media, even social media. Everybody loves the little clips, but you actually don't get to hear what they actually said. You know, like they cut out two words and then you know it's funny and whatever, or maybe it makes them look like a jackass or whatever else, like Ron McLean last night, you know, like, <laughs> oh man, like we could go down that rabbit hole, but I'm just like, uh, that's kind of what's wrong with society right now is you, you hear like the, th- the three second clip and everybody gets outraged over it. And then away we go. Well, and then people don't understand the context, like what Ron said actually wasn't even offensive or anything like that. And you saw that look on the chick next to her, uh, chick next to him's face. She was like, but Really, it was, it's a pretty commonly accepted term in hockey. And everybody knew what he was talking about that actually follows it. But the thing about it is, is that taking short clips out of context for hockey commentators and then firing them because of it is something that we already have an established tradition of in Canada. Do we? Yeah. Have you ever heard of this guy named Donald? Don Cherry. Cherry. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know that name. I had a buddy today tell me, Mm Tuz, 
uh, I got to figure out this two thing. I got to figure out a nickname for you. That <laughs> like, but regardless, uh, he goes, best thing that ever happened. Fuck Ron McLean. I'm so done with him and leaving Dom where he did. He's getting what he mm-hmm. deserved. And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know. But, and then you go back on it. You're like, but then again, Don Cherry said what he'd always been saying. And that's what they, that's what they took him down for. And what do we know about cancel culture? Eventually it comes for all of us, or I think it does because that's what they do. They find a target and hone in on it. And the only way it's going to stop, because it's ridiculous. Like Don Cherry is racist. Okay. What race is he racist against? And then you just get awkward silences and people kind of grumbling and saying that you're mean. But really, (laughs) that's the crux of it, is that he wasn't actually racist about anybody. He's just talking about people not appreciating where they're at in this new stage in their life when they come to a country like Canada. And He's being patriotic. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of where you're from. And to take that and use it as a very, very slim justification to get rid of him is ridiculous. And stuff like that's happened way too much. And the only way it's going to stop is if both sides of this just start drowning in blood, really. Like Bev Oda, this is a while back, but she was that conservative MP that got the taxpayers on the hook for that $16 orange juice. And that worked because conservatives don't want someone managing the funds of the country, which are their money, who's willing to spend $16 on a glass of orange juice. How big was the glass? (laughs) Right. And it doesn't work for people like Trudeau and any one of his million scandals. Like this isn't just blackface and white here. So I think what it comes down to is that the left and the right value things differently. And so on the right, you want personal accountability. You want somebody who's going to walk the walk and the left think it's more important to have somebody in a position of power or someone recognizable who is going to do and say the things that they want. And they put that higher than personal accountability, which is why cancel culture doesn't really work on somebody like Justin Trudeau. But if it, if we can get to the point, honestly, and I hate this, but if we can get to the point where there's enough blood drawn on both sides that everyone's just like, you know what, let's never do this again. Fair enough. Do we get to that point? Do you think we actually get to that point? Like this has been, I don't know how long we've been in this now, two years, three years. I don't really know exactly when it started. I wouldn't even say that Bev Oda was cancel culture even per se, but she was a ways before that. But just this mentality of you wanting to eliminate someone's ability to make a living for themselves because you don't agree with what they say. It's gone too far. It's ass backwards. It's absolutely is. I have no problems disagreeing with somebody about absolutely everything. I had somebody comment on Twitter today. They said that they agreed with what I thought about this whole Ron McLean thing, but also that they disagree with about half of what I say. I was like, that's perfect. Right? Because even though he's disagreeing with half of what I have to say, he's still interested in hearing it. And we need to get away from this tribalism and trying to be nice to the other side just ends up with us being taken advantage of. And I don't like the idea, but if anybody's got a better one, I'm all ears. I don't know. I, I like a good disagreement because, or, or listen to somebody I don't like, because then it forces me to like, be like, well, to kind of be like, what the hell don't I like about it? Okay. And then why don't I like that? Right. And I actually has to force me to kind of dig into my core beliefs of like, okay, So why don't I like this? And then try and articulate that so that you can actually have an argument because no different than you talking about Don Cherry. Well, well, who is he racist to? They've probably never been asked before. And if you've never been asked, you can't be like, well, he was, he was racist to somebody, right? He was racist. I know he was, but if they never really thought about it, they're just angry because they want to be angry because he said, you people, if you go through the list of, you know, the, the amount of you people he said over the course of whatever it was, 40-year career, 50-year career, he said it an awful lot. Oh, absolutely. And actually, that's one of the fun things that I've tried to incorporate into the podcast. I don't know if you've picked up on it or not, but like 
pretty much, I think I missed one episode, but every episode I put you people in there at least once <laughs> in as many different contexts as I can. You know what you kind of remind me of? Like your episodes? What's that? Is like the early days of Family Guy where it is a little more vulgar because you're swearing more, obviously, mm-hmm. which doesn't bother me. Uh, but you don't steer away from any issue. You just like hit it head on. And it's, <laughs> that's fantastic, right? That's why you love, I don't know, back in college, that's why I love Family Guy. Family Guy would yeah. talk about everything. They offended everyone so that nobody was really offended because you're just making fun of everybody and that's fine. It's not discrimination if you're treating everyone the same. That's right. Yeah, I definitely loved old family guy. They really lost me when they kind of parroted Justin Trudeau around as some sort of like a, a paragon of everything wonderful. That episode with him and Trump at that point, I was like, yeah, it just doesn't speak to me anymore. Uh, I would go back a few years even before that. I, I thought their first you know, in the Family Guy world, there's probably like eight years of it where it was fantastic. You could watch yep. any episode mm-hmm. and they just, they found ways to make it. And then just like a lot of good things, right? Like they go that long. Like, you know, you, you just can't make that same joke uh, a thousand times over. Eventually it just kind of loses its like shock value. Yeah, that that whole same joke thing. I've been worrying about that with the podcast because I don't want to get repetitive. And I realized that actually in, in this week's episode, I repeated a joke that I'd made in like the second or third episode. I just realized that this afternoon. I was just like, oh no. I knew it was going to happen eventually because they're really dense. Like the scripts I write for them are all around 2,500, 3,000 words. And it's really rapid fire. Like, like you said, they're 20, 25 minutes kind of thing. And so you know, with that, with that amount of stuff to say, it's going to be pretty easy to, to overlap yourself a little bit here and there. But I guess unless I decide to get some team of writers or something like that, it's just something that people are going to have to deal with. You, you enjoy it? Pardon me? Do you enjoy it? I have a lot of fun with it, but I really am careful about not making it something that I take too seriously because if I turn it into something where I think about it, you know, like a job, then I'm going to be worrying way too much. And I'm constantly having to check myself in terms of it's not perfect, but I like it and it's fun and it's a hobby and I'm getting better. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really difficult to work with even when it's me, probably, especially when it's me. Just because you're critical of of, of how good it is, you mean? Yeah, because I just, I feel like I should be able to just make something off the top of my head like that. All the time. That is going to be perfect and timeless. And if you were ever just thinking about some random thing like the NDP, you could just go back to an issue or an episode where I talked about the NDP and, oh, well, that all makes sense now. And I just, yeah. You know, (laughs) Here, here's a question for you that's been puzzling me for years, okay? Yeah. You're a guy who follows politics. And I ask this all the time, and everybody gives me uh, kind of the same kind of answers. But you were talking about Calgary and mm-hmm. how it's a bunch of blind leading the blind. Mm-hmm. Why is it the best of us aren't in politics? Or are there some of the best of us in there and I just don't give them enough credit? Well, there's, there's a few really good nuggets there's some really good people. Uh, you talked about Brad Wall with Jay last Jay week, Hill, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then you've got guys like Alan Kirpin's going to be a throwback. Maybe there's going to be a few people who know who I'm talking about there. Uh, I've met with Alan. I met with Alan last week. Oh, really? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you've got guys like that that actually did a good job and came Paired. And you've got Jeremy Farkas in Calgary. That was the one guy I was talking about who, when he went in said, I'm not even going to take the pension. I'm just here to make the city better. And I'm not here to become a career bureaucrat. And people like that are hard to come by because it's very much about teams in politics. And it's a lot more about having your team win than having your team do well. Like, look at how many conservative policies 
that aren't actually conservative because they're geared to appeal to Ontario and Quebec, right? They're not trying to do the best job they can. They're trying to do the best job they can of being reelected because it's the number one priority for a politician. And then after that, if there's some time, they'll worry about trying to smooth things out. But you think about it. I mean, we've been in Confederation for a long time, over 150 years now, and we've still got to have this amount of debate over new policies and stuff like that. Things are changing kind of fast, but you'd think that we'd have most of this ironed out by now if we've been doing this for 150 years. But still, it's more about having that, that illusion of making changes. And no one's ever thought like, what if we just let it go? Do we need to keep a tight rein on this thing or that thing? What do you mean? Let it go. What do you expand well, on that for a second? Uh, red tape, for example. Okay. So all our pol all our political parties in Canada have the exact same stance, all our major ones have the exact same stance on pipelines. And you're going to say, well, no, they don't. But I'm not talking about what they say. I'm talking about what effects their policies create. So you've got the, you've got the NDP, the Liberals, the Bloc, and the Green Party who don't want any pipelines. And you've got the Conservatives who say, yeah, we want pipelines, but we're going to put in five years worth of red tape and a billion dollar cost to navigate it on the front end which is longer than an election cycle so the effect is is that no one's no company no sane company is going to risk a billion dollar investment just to get the stamp on the on the approval sheet before they even start work when there is guaranteed to be at least one election before they're done the application process and so the end result is that there's not going to be any pipelines unless there's some sort of ridiculous guarantee and improvement in red tape. And the conservatives have never campaigned for that. They were in charge for a decade and they amended the NEB act, which is what section 52 of the NEB act is what any long pipeline falls under. And the threshold was 40 kilometers and the liberals scrapped that entirely, but the NDP or pardon me, the conservatives amended that a half dozen times the last time they were in power and they didn't even take out the veto. So that same veto that Trudeau used to cancel Northern gateway after they spent a billion dollars navigating the framework. And he just saw it on his desk and was like, fuck no. And just kicked it off the side like a cat. That was something that the conservatives could have taken out at any point. But the thing about it is, is that when you set things up so that, anyone's going to do a good job no matter who's in power it takes away the incentive incentives to vote for the people you want so then do you think you know you mentioned alan carpan uh, mm -hmm. carpen 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 yeah sure anyways you mentioned you mentioned him you listened to jay hill i had mavericks on uh, or jay hill on uh, last week mm -hmm. their idea in my brain makes sense. Do you, as a guy who just sat there and says like all the major, you know, political parties pretty much are the same bloody way. Do they make sense to you then? Absolutely. It, it really resonates me, with me because when you think about it, every political party we have is regional, even though they run candidates all over Canada, what liberal policies have been beneficial for uh, St. Albert or the Duke or Prince Albert. Uh, probably none zero. Of yep. None of them. Yeah. Even they give a few pet infrastructure projects to the places that got their votes in the last election in Western Canada. It's kind of a way to be like, if you guys vote for us, you can also have a little bit of this money that used to be yours, but all their stuff caters to the Maritimes with their revamping of the EI program and Ontario and Quebec. And then even the conservatives, they've never addressed the dairy cartels. They, they say they're for small government, but what you say and what you do aren't always the same yeah. thing, right? They've never addressed unions. They've never took them head on. They've never talked about fixing the uh, pension bubble that's just ready to burst all over Canada. 
Montreal spends 49% of their municipal budget on pensions. Half the money that people spend to keep the city running goes to people who don't even work there anymore. And so you've got all these different parties that when push comes to shove, they pick an area that's going to win them votes. And they just take everything west of Ontario for granted because it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Because again, the whole point is to stay in power. And if they want to stay in power or get into power, they need to cater to Ontario and Quebec. It's why the only time that the NDP had any relevance was when the, when they were the opposition and it was because they swept Quebec. Right. And so you look at it in that way, is there a party for Western Canada? I mean, out of the ones that are existing, I would say no, because a party that's just going to be slightly less bad isn't the same as a party who's going to say, I'm going to go to bat for you. Well, I got to, I got to, you know, your, your politics. It's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to listen to because I got, I got to be very honest at 30, you know, five short years ago, Mm -hmm. I followed politics zero. Like I just didn't care. Like I had, Mm -hmm. I had zero cares with it. I was just like, yeah, they're going to govern. They're going to do whatever they say they're going to do. They're not going to do it. Whatever. Just let me work. I'll carry on. Things will be fine. Away we go. Then Trudeau gets in. And my brain went, well, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And then he got in a second time. And I remember sitting there watching a full election, which to a lot of listeners, maybe they did the same thing too, right? Like I don't have a whole lot of politics on the show or I didn't in the beginning. It was a, it was focused mainly on sports, a little bit of history. And now I find myself talking about it more and more because I'm just so troubled at where we're going. Mm-hmm. And if we don't start changing things soon, I don't know what Western Canada is like, I I just don't get it. So the Maverick party in their platform, I go, if they, if they can deliver on what they're talking about, just like Mm -hmm. anybody, right. It's easy to say one thing and then go in and do jack crap about it. Mm -hmm. Right. If they could do that, all of a sudden you got something you could put a lot of energy behind. And I feel like good people will get involved. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense and it fits. And the big argument, and you and Jay talked about this, is vote splitting. I've got a slightly different take on it. And my thought is, is that it's just as valid for any other party. Because taking votes away from, if you don't want, if you don't want Justin Trudeau to win, you need to vote for the person who isn't Justin Trudeau. And there's about 37 million of us in this country. So to say that that's one person over another one is silly. And when you look at the, the arguments, they're all moot. Because every vote for the conservative party is a vote that the PPC doesn't get. So that's vote splitting. Let Maxime Bernier win. Right. And every vote that isn't for the Maverick party is also vote splitting because why aren't you letting them win? If you, if getting Trudeau out of power is so important, why can't you give up your vote for your guy that you probably don't even like right now? Well, you're getting into the nuts and bolts of politics. Well, the thing about first past the post voting systems is that they're set up to just gradually create two parties. And that creates a system where you end up voting for the person that you hate the least. You probably don't (laughs) like, you probably don't like either one of them. You're, you're saying you're talking, you're talking about the last election. That's exactly what the last election was. You're like, I don't like either of these guys. Yeah. I mean, Andrew Shear, I'm sure he's a great guy. I've never met him, but he seems like just the most boring, uninspiring person. And they didn't have anything in terms of policies that I liked. And now with everything that O'Toole just said, he was going to do a carbon levy and it was just going to be slightly different. And That's the thing. If you're voting, if he's got to go all the way over to where he's only slightly different than Trudeau to win an election, what's the point of voting for him? Why not vote for somebody you actually want? Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I, I go back to last election and Mm -hmm. we come from the conservative part of the country. You talk about different areas. We were like ridiculous amount of conservatives. 
And, but you go around and ask how many people like Andrew Shear, And once again, I, I will agree with you. It has nothing to do with like him being a bad person or anything. It's just as a leader, did you look at him and go, wow, I want to get behind that guy. Mm-hmm. The answer was no, you just want to, you didn't want Justin Trudeau in again. And the popular vote went to the conservatives. And at the end of the day, it didn't mean anything because that's not the way it's set up. No, it's, it's set up to be broken or pardon me. It's, it's broken because it's just set up to fail. It's not a system that in its current state, it doesn't work for can for Western Canada. I mean, we're basically a colony, right? You think about it over the last 20 years, it's been $20 billion a year, $21 billion a year, something like that, depending on what year and which study you look at, but that's $400 billion out of Alberta. And we're 4 million people. That's a hundred grand a head. How many kids you got? Three. Three. You're a family of five. They could cut you a check for half a million dollars tomorrow. And that's not even taking into account the time value of money. Just to just get it, even out the balance book, even out the, the balance, they could cut you a check for a half million dollars tomorrow. And they'd be like, okay, well, now we're even. So here's a question for you. Why aren't you, you know, I, I mentioned, why aren't the best in politics, right? Why aren't they? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know, right? You say you play for a team, you play for this, you play for that. I've gotten so many arguments with people like, I just, yeah, I get it. It's a big, messy system. But when all of us just sit back and watch what goes on and go like, what the hell is going on? Why isn't there a group of just like 100 people, 1,000 people? I don't really care. They just get involved. Why isn't twos involved? Why aren't you, you sound like you're pretty well-versed. Why aren't you throwing your hat in the ring? Well, I don't think anybody would really vote for me. I'm far too blunt about any of this. You think about it, like it's an interesting conversation to have about politics, but if I'm going to have a real conversation about how broken it is and how I want to change it, first of all, people don't want to hear that. And I think that the machine kind of spits you out before you even get to that point where you can actually become, say, a member of parliament and make a difference. But also, I'm just a little bit too abrasive and a little bit too honest to... Don't you think the world needs a little bit of honesty? Absolutely, but they won't vote for it. You don't think so? No. No, I mean, look, at You said you went back and listened to a bunch of the old episodes. Yeah, you probably yeah, yeah. listened to that one about affordable housing and yes. how it doesn't work and exactly why it doesn't work and how it doesn't work. And so if you've got a bunch of people who could use affordable housing and somebody like Jagmeet Singh saying in, you know, that kind of half blank stare he does when he's just sort of confused in front of a camera talking about how we need affordable housing and it's, it's to help people and we need to take care of people. And then I'm going to sit there and do maybe like a five minute rant on the economics of why it doesn't work, how it doesn't work. I'm going to lose everybody. And the people who want good news are going to hear you're better off figuring it out on your own, mathematically speaking. <laughs> and that's not the kind of thing that they're going to vote for. I don't know. I, uh, I feel like there's a way to say it that isn't so abrasive, maybe. Right? Like, yeah. just because I'm all for affordable housing, but affordable housing, the way it's currently drawn up, doesn't work. Now, the best thing if... If someone wants cheaper housing, the best thing they can do is eliminate red tape. Thomas Sowell, who's just an absolute beauty of a man, and the only reason why he isn't probably the most famous person in the world right now is because he says a lot of things that people don't really like to hear. And he's got this, I think it was in Economic Facts and Fallacies. He went into some really big detail about how red tape is pretty non-existent in Texas, and it's huge in the Bay Area and it's huge in New York. And then he brought in a few other places and he just said, look, whether the more red tape you have, the more expensive it is to build and the less affordable it is. So if you want things to be more affordable, rather than trying to have a government that's going to put in a bunch of red tape and then patch over it with affordable housing, why not just simplify things and Reduce just the red not tape. have all the red tape, right? Yeah. Because then also you've got less bureaucrats and someone's got to pay for them. And right now it's our grandkids. Well, was, was politics always like this? Like you're telling, like, 
I, I find when I bring this conversation up with people that are interested in it, mm -hmm. they make it seem so, pardon the French, so fucking helpless. Like, listen, it's just an ugly thing, and you know, yeah, honesty doesn't win, and you know, like, sorry, I'm 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 making you seem like a downer, but it, that's okay. It, it really pisses me off because I'm just like, I don't know. I feel like if if the right people get involved and go in there, maybe it can be changed, and maybe I'm wrong on that. But to me, I just stare at it and I go like, I don't know. You you you, you see a problem, mm -hmm. it just needs, it just needs some leadership in there to help fix it, and people to roll up their sleeves and, and get working. Isn't that how countries were formed in the very beginning and at, at the the earliest sense? Yeah, and I think it's a great point. I guess my perspective is that if I was to if I was to try and put my hat in the ring for sure. any any party, right? Maverick or, or, uh, anything, NDP even, right? Sure. There isn't enough awareness of what's going on and the issues in the general population that my particular brand of fixing things would appeal to a lot of people. And so I think maybe the best thing I should be doing right now is just trying to get the message out about exactly what's broken and maybe some little steps that could be involved in fixing it. And yeah, in terms of trying to make a change, I mean, I'm not, I just started this just to be funny and have fun with it. I know, I know. But, <laughs> but and, and that's what it was at every stage of the evolution. It was just like, oh, well, this is kind of fun. Oh, I can do this too. And and I think that that's probably going to do a lot more in terms of getting the ball rolling than me trying to put myself up as some kind of a figure who can lead sweeping change. Cause I haven't even figured all this stuff out myself yet either. Well, I've figured out zero. Like I feel like I have lived under a rock all my life. I just look at it. I, I, I say this all the time. I do her right. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we need something done. Let's go get it done. Right. Yep. Doesn't mean you got, you, you go in with the blinders on, you certainly got to pay attention and learn and, whatever else. And I just, I just stare back at this and I just go like, this has baffled me for five years now, maybe longer than that of why we don't have, you know, like the best of us just, you know, Brad wall always comes up because to me, when I watched him talk, still watch him talk. I'm like, God, that guy is a, is a leader. That guy's somebody I want to follow. And he's not in the ring anymore. Right. He's, he's, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he's stepped aside and, 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 uh, you know, taking his lumps for sure. Uh, but I don't know where we're going. I have no idea to is where we, where we head in here. Like they're talking about, you know, the, the, the latest thing that came out and people can say what they want, but I, I am, I'm having a hard time understanding it myself. So whatever about the vaccination. And I know this is, this is a taking a hard left, whatever. Sure. So Alberta says today, 50% of 12 and up get vaccinated. And then 60% is phase two and blah, 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 blah. And it all sounds nice and everything. I'm like, why the hell are we getting 12 year olds vaccinated to something that has killed zero of them? There's like hardly any cases of any young person having any ill effects from COVID-19. I'm, I'm like really trying to reconcile that thought process out of our leaders. It makes zero sense to me. I mean, it doesn't, it also really doesn't make sense because you've got this, huge cost involved with the logistics of getting all these vaccines from international companies because we decided to flip the bird to the one in Calgary because it didn't donate to the Trudeau foundation. So you got to pull in all these vaccinations from overseas. You've got to distribute them. They've got a limited shelf life. So there's a lot of supply management and there's a lot of cost associated with that. And we're all, we're getting government people to do it which adds a lot more than anybody could do it privately. And so it's just, it's ballooning things just from a cost standpoint. And I don't really know, I'm not a doctor. And the problem with COVID is that there's just so much stuff out there that is all politically charged. Like, honestly, I have no idea about any of it because you'll get a doctor saying one thing, you'll get a doctor saying another thing. And then all of a sudden he's kicked off of YouTube. And it's really weird because any dissenting voice that goes against what the CDC or the World Health Organization is saying is immediately squashed, but they've contradicted themselves just as much. And you don't see them squashing themselves. 
And the whole thing is just baffling and it's confusing and it makes me suspicious of it. Like I'm not, I'm not crazy about the idea of any of this, but I'm not going to pretend that I am in any way capable of untangling the web. Yeah. Which is a bullshit answer, but which, which still makes you sit there and go, there is a web. It makes no sense. Our leaders, I feel like just, man, they've struggled through this thing. Struggle might be a light term. Well, it's been huge. And there's just, there's been so much scaremongering about it. And so then you've got like in Alberta, you've got the NDP who I'm sure if Notley was in charge right now, we'd all be in cement blocks until the nature took back Alberta. And then she'd say it was safe, but, (laughs) but that would be about it. So she's just been cheering the whole time. And then of course her supporters are all union people, which is all the government employees. And so it's all about, big government solutions and big government solutions and keeping people scared. And then Kenny who wants to get as much support as possible is getting close to that. And the only big voice in the room other than his is hers. And so he's got to acquiesce to it. But I mean, the conservatives in Alberta created the NDP as far as uh, a viable candidate or a, a viable opponent. And so, I mean, they shit in the bed. Now they got to lie in it. I don't know what Kenny's doing. He's trying to appease everyone. And by trying to appease mm-hmm. everyone, he's appeasing no one. Exactly. The, the, both sides hate Kenny at this point. They're like, yeah. lock it down hard. He's not locking it down hard enough. The other side's yelling, he's locking it down way too much. And it's just like, even in his press conferences, he's like trying to like do this dance, which is like, you've, you've been doing no dance for like the last six months. I don't think anybody's happy with you. Median voter theorem. Have you ever heard of it? No. Okay. So the idea is just real quick. You've got people on one side of a spectrum that want one thing and people on another side that want another thing. And so you've got two candidates who are each trying to cater to them, but also win. And so then they keep moving further and further to the center to try and make up the difference of the votes they need to win. And then eventually you've got two candidates who are pretty much right in the middle with in this area that nobody likes, but they're slightly not as bad as the other person. Median voter theorem. That's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. Man, politics sucks. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I Maybe this will be the puzzlement I have until I die on why people just don't get in and run. And I, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess it just baffles me. It just baffles me how they're there are really smart people in our world that understand what's going on, see ways that they could probably do things that I think a lot more people than they give credit to would be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I mean, yeah, we got to do th- some things, but we got to take some lumps here and we got to, we got to do that. We got to do this and okay, great. Right. And instead we all just kind of hang back and, and see what's going to happen here. And I guess we're, we're in for a ride. Cause I, I don't know where this is going. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Like, I really hope the Maverick party, does well i haven't seen much in terms of the finer points of their platform but just as a concept if it doesn't work for the west they're not going to support it that's a great idea and the traditional avenue being the conservatives that consideration always gets weeded out before it even gets brought up because asking for something fair for alberta and saskatchewan and manitoba means taking away some type of entitlement from the rest of Canada. And so they don't want to, they don't want to rock the boat, the waters. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So sorry guys, we're just going to need that. If you could get us that 20 billion bucks, you know, by the end of the month, that'd be great. And also we haven't done anything about pipelines, not a winning strategy. And so just on that concept alone, I think it's going to be really good. I'm going to be, supporting them unless something unexpected happens i guess never say never maybe they've got some weird policy that they're going to roll out that's just going to disagree with me vehemently but aside from that it's the best vehicle i think we have within our current broken system to affect change so you bring up broken broken system all the time um, yeah, I guess I've been saying that a lot. Sorry. Yeah, well, no, I just, I guess, do you have a theory then on what would be better? 
<laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So <laughs> the whole thing about remember when in 2015, the liberals ran on the platform of voter reform. They said that the 2015 election was going to be the last first past the post one. And nobody actually believed them because it would mean that they would never have an easy majority again. Right. But the thing when, when conservatives are arguing with each other, it's kind of like, like Calvinists and Lutherans, you know, they just, they're almost the same on everything, but then there's just a few minor details here, here and there. And, and then they end up just putting up huge roadblocks because if you're not voting for me, then like, if you're not with me, then you're against me. And so there's all these big arguments about vote splitting and whatnot. And if there was some type of a ranked ballot, there's a few different other kinds, and I'm still trying to figure out some of the nuance of it. So don't, don't say that I support specifically ranked ballots for the record, but some type of thing where you can have multiple choices in terms of who you would like to lead. And then even if that guy, that's your ideal guy doesn't win, you're still putting your support behind someone who can. And then that's actually going to do a lot in terms of like on the left and the right, it would do a lot in terms of bringing in new ideas, because if you're dealing with one establishment and you don't want to do exactly what they do, you've got no chance. Look at the independence in the States, right? Cause it's all Republican and Democrat. And they've got pretty much the exact same way of doing things. Typically on the, on the political spectrum, they're practically hugging. Generally they've kind of the, the Democrats have kind of gone off the deep end a little bit lately, but any ideas outside of that have no chance of even getting to a point where they could make changes. And so I really think electoral reform of some kind is going to be the best thing for Canada as a whole. But generally speaking, I just think that Canada doesn't work for far too many of us that are in it. And we need to think about, are we willing to change it or do we need to just walk away from an abusive relationship? So you're a separatist then? Yes. So, I mean, you think about it, there's four different possible outcomes, right? One, say Alberta, just as the, the center of it, because it's the loudest voice right now. Alberta walks away, they become their own country. And then they, they can kind of play the Canada, US off each other in terms of dealing for coastal access and stuff like that. Or the other thing is that they get uh, a few provinces and maybe even a few states to go with them. They get Manitoba, they'll get the church... Uh, the Churchill River where it meets Hudson Bay and they've got coastal access there. Maybe they bring the top half of BC and Vancouver wants to stay or even do their own thing. And then the other way is maybe they join the States and do something like what Puerto Rico did where they're part of the States and they've got kind of the benefits that go along with that, but they don't take on their share of the national debt. Or the other thing is, and I would have no qualms with this either is if we finally get to a point where we're walking out the door, like we've got one foot out the door, we've decided, we've voted on it, we are leaving. And then the rest of Canada's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. What if, and then we have that conversation, right? Because nothing, nothing that Western Canada is asking for is unfair. Like having equal voting power compared to the rest of Canada, uh, Alberta's got the, the worst. It's, it's about every 120,000 people get one member of parliament. And then on the other end of it, you've got PEI where 35,000 people. So get one member of parliament. So effectively your vote is worth about one quarter of what someone in PEI's is. Even Quebec's the second worst. They've got the population to help them out, but they've, they've got the second worst. And even that's still about 10% higher voter power if you think about it, then Alberta. So what you're saying is Maverick has to work because yeah. that like, you just go back to it. I, I feel like for so long, I was just, you know, maybe all of us were just kind of closed off to it. Not really thinking too much, right. Conservative, 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 conservative. But when you think about it and you talk about how diverse this country is mm -hmm. and just that's okay. It's okay. We're diverse. 
there's not a big deal wrong with that. No, I'm totally fine with that. But, but at the end of the day, a federal party in order to get elected, because that is the job, is it not to get elected? Yep. Yep. You have to pander to everyone. You got to find ways to make everyone happy. And if you're going to upset the East where all the votes, the majority of votes are, you ain't winning. Yeah. So and it's like. The thing about it is you ever hear that old adage or whatever, if you chase two rabbits, they'll both elude you. Right. And that's the conservative party's strategy right now in terms of reelection. And they're just getting trounced in the polls where they're trying to be everything to everyone. And as such, they're nothing to anyone. And Jason, honestly, Kenny. I, I, yeah, I think, I think that the best thing, yeah, Jason Kenny, perfect example. I think the best thing that, that the conservative party could do would just be to just say that they, they just, written off the West and it would be really counterintuitive because that's where all their power is. But I mean, unless they did a, a big change in terms of their paradigm and platforms and stuff like that, it really accurately represents a lot of people in Ontario and Quebec. And I don't fault them for voting for them because it works for them. You've got a lot of people dependent on that dairy cartel and the conservatives have shown time. And tell again me a little bit about the dairy cartel. Oh, Okay. How about just some real quick Coles notes? It's a protectionist industry where you, you got to pay to get in a stupid high amount. You can't sell your stuff outside of it. And so they control how much they have and how much they're willing to, to sell it for. It's like the De Beers diamond thing. You know how De Beers controls like 95% of the diamonds in the world or whatever. And right. then they just eke them out a little bit so that people pay more. It's the same thing, except instead of, rocks coming out of the ground it's glorious uh, it's glorious dairy coming out of a milk's titty <laughs> and that's it it's you think about it like they, so are you saying are you saying they have an oversupply of milk and with that they're dumping and everything else well they or have they... done that historically but the thing is that they control they control who's allowed to like i couldn't just I couldn't just buy a few cattle and start selling milk. You know, I can't just do the bootleg milk thing. No one's allowed to do that. You've got to work within their thing. And it, in, in any protectionist industry, the only people who really benefit are the ones that are in it. But then you kind of got the ripple effects where it's also good for their local economies and whatnot. Like there was two people in my hometown that had a pool growing up. One guy owned the restaurant and the other guy had the dairy farm. I'm glad that they have pools, but I'm just saying that that it ends up just it unfairly it unfairly affects the market and you've got people paying a lot more than they should for everyday household items. Like look at the look at New Zealand. They wanted to ship they wanted to ship milk from New Zealand all the way into Canada for a while because they could make a go of it. They could get their milk on a tanker go all the way across the Pacific, which it doesn't get much further than that. And they're doing it diagonally and then get it on trains and then ship it off to wherever the heck they're going to have it in whatever grocery stores. And they were still going to be able to cut a profit even at the market rates that are in, in Canada because they're so artificially high compared to what it actually costs to do it. That hurts the brain. Pipelines hurt the brain. Melk's hurting the brain. Twos is on a roll because he's just making my brain hurt today. <laughs> well, uh, what else do you want to crack into? Well, the 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 Netflix YouTube thing I was saying to you before we started. Yep. Like, I guess I just didn't really. I don't know. You as a person, do you do you, like when it's a subtle little change like that? Do you really pay attention? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. But for most of us. You, what I'm getting at is uh, on one of your podcasts, you talk about uh, uh, hiding dissenting voices and mm -hmm. you use uh, YouTube and Netflix and Netflix. I feel like everybody can remember this because we went from the star system, right? Like you had, mm -hmm. oh, you know, rated it with the stars and then you could see what everybody rated it. And then, oh, that must not be that good. Right. So you're not going to watch it now. It's just a thumbs up, thumbs down. And you actually don't see what anything's rated. 
Actually, at times you see what's the top 10 of Canada and you go, are we a bunch of dumbasses? Why is that number one? Who is putting thumbs up on that show? Who is still watching Tiger King at this point? Exactly. Right? Like, it's like, okay, what's going on? Anyways, that, that's yeah. what I wanted to bring up. Yeah. So just real quick, I guess, uh, addendum to what you were saying, because that was exactly right. But they went and changed that system right after Amy Schumer did that gloriously terrible comedy show on YouTube that just got decimated in the ratings. And then they're like, okay, well, we need to change this. What do we do? And so rather than where people can see the rankings, like you said, all you can see is you might like this and whether you've given it a thumbs up or a thumbs down to just hide. You're talking Amy Schumer on Netflix, right? Yeah. 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 You said YouTube, Netflix. Oh, she me. had, she, was that the movie? No, she's been in a few bad movies from what I understand. <laughs> Yeah, she has. But this I'm going to be on. I got like a stand up special. The funny thing about it is, I, I don't know why they get so upset. Amy Schumer comes on, and I'm just like, yeah, I just got no time for it. Like, I watch like 10 minutes of her one movie. I'm like, man, this is this hurts the brain. Like, no more. So carry I mean, on. Yeah, there's so it's interesting because you don't sometimes, I guess you don't want people realizing how much you suck or how bad you are. And if there's just this huge collective backlash against something you're doing, you'd prefer if not a lot of people knew. And then if you're controlling the things that make that happen, you can do it. And then now net or YouTube, pardon me, is trying to experiment a little bit in terms of hiding the likes and dislikes for the U S uh, presidential YouTube channel because they're just gloriously decimated. And if people aren't happy with the government, they should, that's something that people ought to know about, right? Instead of just being like, nope, nope, you are going to, you're going to be told that everything's fine and that's it. I don't, I don't like that. I prefer honest conversations with people. I was listening to Andy Frizzella. Uh, he's got a podcast. It's uh You'd enjoy it. Okay. Um, what is it called? Here, give me a sec here and I'll pull it up. Um, buddy of mine, Ken Rutherford, got me onto it. And uh, some of it's a bit much. Some of it's like really good. It's real as fuck with Andy Frizzella. Real AF with Andy okay. Frizzella. Anyways, he's very much on the line of, uh, uh, you know, He's got his own theories, but one of them being that the last election was not proper, right? And I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah, sure, maybe not. But, but you talk about dissenting voices and whatever. He he starts talking about how he starts talking about Barack Obama. And I, I when I think of politicians and the best one I've ever witnessed speaking, Barack Obama was by far just care. He still is one yeah. of the most charismatic men to ever stand on a stage and talk. Very well and, spoken. Oh my goodness. And at the time, he was uh, the most voted for president of all time. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> Annie Frazella goes, and you're telling me Biden, who can't piece together two sentences, is the most voted for of all time? And yet he can't get anybody out to his, his, his yeah. uh, like, to nothing. And then you talk about the, and I guess the reason I bring it up is because, uh, and I'm talking about his rallies, like, there's nobody there, right? Mm -hmm. Trump comes out. And everybody's going to say, well, it's a difference. You know, um, Democrats, they don't really like think COVID and they're trying to stay home and blah, blah, blah. It's like, hey, listen, you can say whatever you want. At the end of the day, if he's the most voted for of all time president of the United States of America, you'd think there'd be some fanfare. Yeah. And it's interesting when you think about it. So there was like 75 and 78 million or something like that for, yeah. for the two candidates. So you're looking at 150 million votes. And the official stance is that there was no voter fraud. Like if the chances of voter fraud were one in 150 million, then statistically speaking, there's at there least was one ballot out there <laughs> that went wrong. So to say, cause here's the thing is I'm sure that there's voter fraud in Canada. And I'm, I had, when I ended up graduating our valedictorian vote had to be redone because of voter fraud. And <laughs> no, this was in university, right? <laughs> Somebody really wanted that. 
Yeah, there was more votes than there were people in the class. And somebody couldn't count. <laughs> well, well, somebody somebody wanted to win, and so they tried submitting an extra few votes or whatever. And and yeah, they're like, well, there's more people in the class. There's more. There were more votes than there were people in the class, so they had to redo it. So just to say that voter fraud is this ridiculous concept that never happens is totally untrue. But to say, no, it absolutely did not happen. Well, that's not being honest. Have an honest conversation about it. Be like, these are some of the holes that we've had. This, these are some of the issues. You know, we think it's we think it's pretty darn close. Like the whole point of the election being in the end of November or whatever it was, and then they've got that time before the inauguration where you're actually supposed to challenge this stuff. The whole point is to make sure that it's on the up and up. That's what it's there for. And, and there's a whole bunch of different things that kind of went this way and that on it. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if they kind of accidentally went Superman two a little bit, you know, or like office space, you know how they just wanted to steal, like, you know, just like the tenths of the pennies. And then they <laughs> accidentally just got a stupid amount of money overnight. And then I, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that's exactly what happened. They're like, oh, I guess he's the uh, most popular president ever. <laughs> what else are we going to say at this point? Uh, yeah, the voter fraud, like, I don't know. Me and uh, me and the brothers get in this argument all the time. Like, it, it does me go no good to w worry about it. Like, I'm just a... Uh, I'm not even a fly on the wall in that conversation. I'm so far removed from that conversation. It's not even funny. But then you start hearing like, uh, you know, mail-in ballots now coming to Canada. And you go like, I don't know how I feel about that. Like well, I in, just. In Newfoundland, they let a few people vote by phone. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't just a punchline I made up for the podcast. They let I think it was like four people or seven people or something like that vote by phone. And so the thing about it is, is as far as mail in ballots go. As a concept on their own, they're not inherently flawed, but there just needs to be some safeguards in place. Like you should be able to get some kind of a indecipherable code or whatever that comes along with your ballot. And then you should be able to look that up later on on the government website and see, okay, well, I actually didn't vote for the liberals four times. So there's an issue here. Right. And then like, they're not necessarily a blockchain Listen, type thing, but there ought to be a little bit of traceability and a little bit of transparency in this. You know, it's funny. I, I don't know why I keep forgetting about this example. We talk about fraud and we go, well, maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't, you know, like whatever. All you got to go back to is Russia in the Olympics and uh, the the lengths yeah. they went to to make sure their piss test passed. Like you just look at the brilliant, like brilliance behind it. Mm -hmm. Like I give them kudos. Yeah. Except you were totally breaking the law, trying to like make sure your none of your athletes get caught. And that that's a country like mm -hmm. that. That is a country. And I know we could talk about Russia and whatever else, but it's like to think that none of us have that ability on this side of the pond well maybe that's a little far stretch yeah especially when it's a guy like donald trump that half the world truly did hate because mm. some of the things that came out of his mouth even when i went oh man just turn the twitter thing off just turn it off yeah he definitely he did some good stuff he did some bad stuff but he definitely shook things up and because of that i think a lot of people on both both sides really didn't like them because everything was nice and easy. You just, you showed up and you got your multi-million dollar backroom deals and everything was good. And then you're like, you try and go buy off the president. And he's like, no, I'm good. I already got a bunch. I'm like, well, that isn't how it works. Aren't you supposed to set up a foundation and then kill Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> But yeah, so it it was definitely it was this huge adjustment that everybody had to make. And I think that that a lot of people on both sides are really happy that it's gone back to the status quo where it's just poli politicians pattering to special interest groups and bureaucrats getting rich while no one's looking.
<laughs> what do you I'm think? Of, what, what, do you, what do you think all the lockdowns across Canada? I am not a fan. I think it's interesting when you look at Georgia, I think was the first place to open up in the States. And now you've got pretty much everybody below the Mason Dixon line is back to totally normal. You see ball games with full stadiums and yet I'm not allowed to go out for beers with a buddy of mine. And the economic devastation has just been horrible. Um, There's a lot of businesses that don't exist. There's a lot of industries that don't exist anymore because of that. And that's going to take generations to come back from. And Jay talks about the brain drain. There's a lot of people that have left Western Canada lately. And if this keeps up and your only viable option is to go somewhere where you can actually make a living, you're going to have to do it. Right. And there's been a lot of mental health. I mean, how many people do you know that drink more? I ask you as you take a sip of beer, how many people do you know who drink more today than they did 16 months ago? Right. Well, try and put this properly in the last 14, 16 months. Mm -hmm. The thing that I have seen that has been more evident than anything has been the mental crisis that is starting to impact a ton of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, then comes, I don't know, drinking, uh, just not good things for the, the well being of a person. And I, I, I'm not sitting here trying to make it out like everybody's like that. That's not true. But it's more evident to me than COVID is. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's like, well, that, that's not good. Like, that's really not good. No, it's, it's absolutely horrible. And it's really interesting because that conversation about if it saves just one life, well, we need to lock down because if it saves just one life, it's worth it, regardless of the cost. Well, we need to open up because if it saves just one life, it's worth the cost, right? I mean, I've heard some stuff about suicide spiking lately. I don't know any specifics of it and I can't really verify it, but it would make sense. I imagine that there's a lot of broken families that have come out in the past year and a half and and a lot of people that mentally probably aren't able to do as good of a job as they could in terms of being effective at work and things like that. Right. Cause you're, you're going to come back and you're just, it's like Lindros with the concussions basically <laughs> is I think that's going to be, that's going to be the way for a lot of people and that's going to hurt our GDP and it's going to hurt their ability to live comfortably. And there's just so many ripple effects. Yeah. I don't think you can so, feel, you, you can't see you, you. People don't live 10 years from now. I mean, how oh, I don't live 10 years from now. It's hard mm-hmm. to see where we're going. You can just feel like, we're not going somewhere we want to be like, we just, it, 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 like when Jay Hill, you know, he's talking about the debt and I go like, just break it down for me so I can understand. Right. Like you're talking billions and trillions of dollars. It means fucking nothing to me. We'll be like Venezuela. It's like, okay. Yep. Now we're talking. All right. You know, the nice thing about Venezuela though, is they don't have any sort of vermin. It's they're rat free because the people have eaten them. Right. And so, I mean, Alberta is already rat free. But if we want to get the rest of Canada on board, probably the simplest way to do it rather than some mass uh, eradication program or some government thing that we could implement with exterminators, let's just all be socialists for a while. Oh, that's a scary thought. Yeah, like in- I, I'd rather have a few rats personally, right? But yeah. I, I, the- I've, read, I've read enough uh, Russian history to know like... Oh man, back what what years was that? The fifties. Well, I mean that Late depends 40s. on what part of Russian history you want to talk about. Yeah. Well, but, uh, they they just talk about cannibalism, and I'm not. I mean, geez, I'm going to a dark spot here. But they talk about eating rodents, and they talk about, you know, like they just they talk about it not being a good place because they just had nothing. And on top of it, it's fucking cold for a good chunk of the year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess bonus, if you're a cannibal, a human's a lot to eat in one sitting, and it's probably not going to go bad for a few days because it doesn't get warm enough. <laughs> you know, on a side note, I, I was yeah. reading uh, a Big Bear's book 
I still haven't finished it. It's, uh, but Big Bear was one of the leaders from around this area back in the 1800s. Okay. And in his book, they talk about the buffalo slowly disappearing and, you know, and roaming and trying to find things and, mm -hmm. and starvation setting in. And uh, they wrote about cannibalism in there. I don't mean to be nonchalant, like it wasn't a big deal, but like they'd seen it enough that they knew the signs of cannibalism. And I'm like, that is crazy. Yeah. Right. Like, and th that's, I mean, that's well over a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. but that's, that's in this area. And that's back in a time, you know, when by all means, uh, people from the States and Canada and Britain, Britain decimating the Buffalo population and taking away their livelihood, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. But the fact that like smallpox was, was roaming the lands back then, just decimating the population that way as well. And then on top of it, for it, there to be stories in there about cannibalism, I was like, oh man, that's tough. Yeah. You see, like, it's one thing to be able to look at someone and say, oh yeah, that guy's from Manitoba. It's a totally different thing to be able to look at someone and say, that dude's a cannibal. That guy's eight, that, that person's, you know, feasted on human. That's right. Yeah. You think they, they talked about him having the shakes, like, especially, I don't know what the, you know, I think I've heard something about that before. I, I don't know the finer points of it. I think it was something to do with eating their brains or something, but yeah, I, I've heard of something like that at some point. Well, once again, I just, you know, like this is a, I go across the river to Frenchman Butte mm -hmm. and, uh, and the museum there. And I said, well, what's the best book you got? Oh, this one. All right. It's about Big Bear. It's fantastic. It's, it's very interesting. It's, you know, for the longest time, I didn't understand why, you know, like Joel, uh, Joe Biden, right? How old is he? 78? Eight. Yeah. And everyone's like, including myself, why would you ever elect a 78 year old? It makes zero sense to me. Well, in the book, it actually makes it, you know, here, back in the day, they had two leaders. They had the peacetime leader, who was the old elder who just had seen a lot and knew how to navigate things. But then they had the 30 year old or 40 year old when war came and you needed to go to war. You needed somebody energetic and ready to go into battle. And so they had two leaders, one for wartime, one for peace. And I was like, well, maybe that's why a Joe Biden actually isn't a terrible fit. Maybe he isn't. Maybe he isn't. I don't know. Well, how much day to day stuff do you think he's doing at this point? I'm I'm planning like I mean, the guy. The guy can't form a coherent thought. I said in the last podcast, I said, I'm sure he's going to sign this thing in crayon, right? Uh, about <laughs> about a new bill that's going through. And, and the other thing is combine that with how actively they've been propping up Kamala Harris. Because I have never seen a vice president. And I'm not super, like I haven't been following politics since I was four or some crap like that, right? But I have never seen a VP get as much publicity as Kamala Harris has not even close. And I think they're just gearing them up to either gently step down because they don't want a scandal. Right. Uh, but just gently step down and just be like, Hey, I'm a little bit too old for this or just have a heart attack and pass away at the age of 78 with two bullets in the back of his head. <laughs> Do you think Joe goes to bed going, well, hon, I wonder if they're going to come do it tonight then? Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, if I was Joe Biden and I thought they were going to kill me, I would have ran the exact same campaign he did, which was stay at home. <laughs> like He could not have tried to win that thing any less. And I'm sure, you know what? I would be the least bit surprised if he looked at it and he was like, Hillary is going to murder me if I win. So I'm just <laughs> going to stay in bed. Maybe that's why he had the stutter. I don't know. Maybe. I just, I, I feel like he didn't even try and half-ass it. And the amount that he phoned it in told me that he didn't want to win at all. And it would fit if he figured that they'd just kill him off and make Kamala run things. Afterwards. You know what's funny? Uh, after uh, I watched... Uh two of the presidential debates. I actually thought he did half decent. Like he, yeah. but then again, he's up against Trump. So I honestly, I don't know. It's such a hard thing to like, 
You got well, Trump I mean, on one hand where at times he just should have said nothing. He, like literally had to say nothing. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting when you look at Trump, he seems like someone who would do really well in terms of dominating a boardroom. And that kind of seemed like his approach to the debates. And it comes across comes across as really aggressive and demeaning towards the other person. And it really wasn't the right tactic for that. It didn't it. I think it made Joe look a lot better. And it was interesting that that version of Joe that was at the debates. Haven't seen him before. Haven't seen him since. It was really quite remarkable. You know, you're kind of half expecting him to come out there with like an IV bag or something. And then he just shows up and acts like a man 20 years younger than what he is. And then just goes back to frail and confused immediately afterwards. Like they just, they had a chip in his brain, but it only had enough power to work for 60 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I got to ask, coming back to Canadian politics mm-hmm. here, Farm Cat had asked on, on, on Twitter, who you yep. think would be a prime candidate to run in the next election for the Maverick Party? Who, do you, who would you like to see sign up for the Maverick Party? Our good friend Quick Dick, I think, would be great. Uh, I think is Quick that, Dick ever going to get into politics? I don't really know him well enough to speculate. I think that, but we can I'm, speculate. Quick Dick okay. is listening right now in the tractor, bouncing along or in Blue Ball or wherever he's at. He's listening to this, so hey, we Blue get to Ball. speculate. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think it's going to be a logical destination for him at some point, like where because I mean he's just it. It's going to be either that or he's going to get a TV show it's going to be one or the other, right? Because he's just doing too well with what he's doing and it's resonating with too many people. And he's got a completely different message than I do. His is positive and uplifting and mine is everything's garbage. And people like hearing that. And just, it's, it's great to see the viewer count when you go to his YouTube videos and stuff like that. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Right. And the thing about it is, is he's also really active in the community. You know, he's helping out with tell a miracle a little while ago and, He's done all kinds of stuff for like stars and other fundraisers and whatnot. And, uh, and, uh, quick, if you're listening, I can't wait to uh, see you on a pedal bike in about 10 days when the bike for breakfast from Lloyd comes to your front door and we'll see who's faster big shooter. Yeah, that'll, that'll be good. But yeah, I think it'll be interesting because he's a guy who genuinely cares about trying to make things better. And I think that that would probably appeal to him. And I think it would just get to the point where he would just be such a household name in Saskatchewan and Canada, really. There's lots of people always commenting from, you know, I'm watching you in Barrie, Ontario or whatever else. Right. And so he'd be a shoe in at a certain point as, as a candidate, if he just wanted to put his hat in the ring. And so for that, yeah, I think it's an easy logical conclusion and there's lots of, there's lots of MPs that still keep farming on the side. So it's not like he'd have to quit his love. Does he keep the beard if he becomes a politician? It's his, uh, it's, I don't want to say shtick, but it, it's quick. I can't think of a better word, right? Uh, he put some old video he did where he was just totally baby faced. And it's, it's funny to look at. You almost don't even recognize the guy. I'm not a huge fan of the beard myself. <laughs> but it's totally him, right? And it totally works. So that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of the beard, he says. I love the beard. <laughs> Quick, don't get rid of the beard. I look forward to seeing that thing in person, live and living color. Yeah, that's going to be great. You guys are going to finally meet in person. Well, you're you're just becoming a long list of people that I met through doing this. It's been the, you know, of all the things I've hated about COVID, this has been one of the best, most positive things that could possibly happen, which is I've been having these wonderful conversations with multiple different people that I've never met before through a screen mm-hmm. and and just talking about like, yeah, I don't know, like I consider it uh, relevant to what's going on currently. And whenever, when else would you have gotten to do this? Like when would, like if COVID wasn't a thing, maybe, maybe the twos would have come along and, and been just as popular. Maybe it wouldn't have, right? Like maybe you would have been down a different alley and not even thought to start this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been doing the Twitter thing for coming up on a few years, I guess, but the podcast, 
I don't know. It's just listen. Your your Twitter is good. Your podcast yeah. is better. That's well, but I mean, keep in mind that Twitter is where I kind of try out jokes and things yes. like that. Hone things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it's the it's the filter that everything goes through before it ends up on the podcast. So yeah, I try things out and I'm like, Oh, this is an interesting idea or people are interested in hearing about this or this joke absolutely killed it. The funny thing is though, that written word doesn't always translate as well to spoken jokes and and the other way around. I've written some stuff that's absolutely hilarious, but if you said it out loud, it would just land flat. Try me. Oh, I just, uh, it was interesting. I had this, I, I'm not going to get into it too far, but on that blog that I had a million years ago, I told this really, really funny story about a bad experience in Mexico and severe dehydration and the medical difficulties I had with my backside. And it was just absolutely like, it was it's one of the funniest things I've ever written, but you read it out loud and it just, it doesn't sound funny at all. I feel like but, you're leaving out like half the details. Uh, I don't know. Um, I went down to Mexico. I got really, really drunk for a lot of days in a row and it was hot. And so, I mean, I was at the point where there was like no moisture in my system aside from, from lime juice and beer. And, uh, and then I went on this just, ridiculous random thing where I was supposed to get on this booze cruise and I ended up on the wrong one. And then <laughs> I wasn't there with anybody I knew. And so I ended up meeting these random people. And then this dude asked me if I wanted to smoke some weed and that's not really my thing, but I'm like, ah, I'm on vacation. Sure. I'll try some. And then this girl comes up and she's all like, Hey man, how's it going? And being all flirty. Cause she wants a hit. And then, um, and we're just standing there talking and then her boyfriend shows up and, and, uh, and then I didn't realize, but the pipe was empty. And then she was like, you were, uh, you were lying to me about weed to try and get sex. And I was like, you were lying to me about sex to try and get weed. And then her boyfriend's just howling. And then we end up at some other random bar. And then I get back and I'm talking to this girl at the, at the hotel and the night's been a bust, but then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, well, you know what? Maybe things are turning around. And then I get really, really sore and sharp and painful um, around my butt. And so I got a bail. And so I just like run back to my room and I'm like, what's going on. And I'm like, it's sticking out and it hurts. And I'm like, what can I do? And then I'm just like, I dump up my shaving kit and, uh, and I'm like, what do I got? Like that can fix this. And I'm like, the best thing I got here is um, aftershave. And that, believe it or not, is just the worst thing you could ever imagine. And so then, because I'm just, I'm so sunburned at that point. And then I've got this stuff that just, the whole back end's on fire. I'm like, ah! And so I just slam the shower on and jump in and then it goes all the way hot. And I'm a freaking lobster at this point already. And it's just bad to worse. And the whole thing was just this cascade of bullshit. But it was really funny to talk about later, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. That's a pretty funny story. Uh, I, I, I could be wrong. I'm laughing. I, to <laughs> me, I'd love to have read the, the blog, but that, that's a pretty good reenactment of it. I'll, I'll send it to you. It, it hits harder on paper, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. Right. So sometimes it's just like anything in comedy. Cause I do really try and be funny with it. And so sometimes stuff, some stuff works in one medium and it doesn't work in others. Right. And that's kind of just what I was talking about, I guess. Okay. Well, I've kept you for, for an hour and change. Yeah. Um, it's been good. Well, let's do the crude master final five, five quick questions. Yep. We can go as long or as quick as you want on these. Uh, one of them will be pretty quick, but regardless, <laughs> shout, shout out to Ethan Tracy McDonald, uh, supporters of the podcast since the very beginning. Um, first I, I always, I'm always curious, uh, if you could sit and do what I'm doing, pick somebody's brain, right? Who, who would you, who would you want to sit down with? 
I would want to sit down, hands down, Thomas Sowell, but I'd need like a few months to prepare ahead of time because the guy just knows so much about everything that I'd kind of want to just just spend a month reading just so that I could try and keep up with him when I was talking to him, you know? Like, I don't know. I, uh, I got to look into him. I, I, honestly, I do. I, I, but I, I, would, I would say, I don't know. It might be fascinating to just go in, sit back and listen. Like, honestly, just yeah. soak it in. Well, that's, that's exactly it. But I feel like, I feel like his time would be better spent if I did more of the building blocks ahead of time so that he didn't have to break it down me through it. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, the guy literally wrote the book on basic economics. Like if you, here's the thing about the NDP is if you take any NDP voter and you can convince him to read this book, I promise you they will never vote NDP again. And it's funny because it's called basic economics, but it just, it totally throws every far left ideology and everything about trying to help things by just making more problems and thinking about the ripple effects and stuff. It throws it all on its head. And the guy's absolutely fascinating. So that's, that's who I do, but I would definitely want to make the most of it. And so I work ahead of time and get ready. What's one subject you haven't talked yet about on, on, on the podcast that you would like to, you, you mentioned that you've got tons and tons and tons of ideas. <laughs> What's one of the ones that you're, you want to get on there, but you haven't yet. Uh, I've got, I've got a few that I think are going to piss a lot of people off. Uh, one of them definitely is taking care of seniors. I'm going to have a very, very unpopular podcast that's going to make a lot of people very mad at me and probably never want to hear from me again. And because of that, I'm kind of looking forward to doing it. You enjoy, you enjoy the public outcry, don't you? Making well, people I squirm just, a little bit. If, if some people aren't, if people aren't having any kind of a reaction to any of this, it means that it's not resonating and I'm not doing a good job because if there's going to be a lot of people who get really offended by the things I bring up and talk about and something like that, it means that it's probably true. Look at how mad the left got last week with Justin Trudeau taping over that HP sticker with an Apple logo, right? The, the, the right side of the country was just mocking him. And then the left side was just over the top upset. And I think it's because they realize that he's just a vapid shell his head definitely is. And they're, they're coming around to that idea and they don't want to admit it, but they still, they still realize it's there. And yeah, a really unpopular conversation about Canada pension plan. I think it's probably going to be that I haven't even started writing it yet, but I've got it kind of fleshed out in my head and it's not going to be well received, but it's going to be very true. I look forward to hearing them. <laughs> I uh, I look forward to hearing them. I had quite the day today. I got to be honest. I listened all the way back from North Battleford. I listened to the what would have been the four that I'd missed in the middle. Yep. And a couple times you had me in tears. Just caught off guard a little bit. And that's awesome. I think that's that's a talent. That's a that's a talent. Well, I really try and make it. There's a lot of podcasts where people are talking, and it's them just kind of free flowing ideas. I don't know if you've seen any clips from Sarah Silverman's thing, but she'll yep. she'll do like one idea a minute kind of thing. And it's just, you look at that, you think it could just be so easily condensed. Spoiler alert, it can't be easily condensed. It ends up taking way too much time and I pull my hair <laughs> out, but it can definitely be condensed. And so that was kind of my methodology was I want to do something that's different than just sitting there with a mic on a boom arm and just kind of pondering the world i just want to hit it fast i know everybody's time's valuable so talk fast get in listen get out right and then because of that a lot of the jokes they're going to catch you off guard because there's no big lead up to it and and you've already i've already moved on to the next thing by the time you're finished reacting to it and some people like that a lot uh i've got a few buddies who say that they've got to listen to them all twice and i'm like well that works great because now my viewer counts up I don't know about that. Viewer count might not be up on, on Apple. If you listen to it from the same device, it doesn't recognize it. Oh, okay. Well, 
I, but I'm still regardless. figuring all this stuff out. Yeah. Hey, we'll go to Twitter now. Twitter, mm-hmm. Twitter lit up with you uh, and the announcement of you coming sitting here. So I like, I, I like the name the best. Disco Stud says, uh, "If you were a tree, what what kind would you be?" Alta Cane. If you know it, you know it. <laughs> what? You you don't know what Alta Cane? No, tell me what Alta Cane is. Oh, the crooked trees of Alta Cane. All right, so a little bit northwest of Saskatoon, you've got this tiny little bluff on the edge of a field, and there's another bluff like 20 feet away where it's all just normal poplars. But all the poplars in this one, they all grow up at all these weird stunted angles, and they're always going off in weird directions. And I don't know what the heck it is, but they just, they're always going off in weird directions. And so, yeah, if I was a tree... You'd be Alta King. I'd be one of the crooked trees of Alta King. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, it's you just show up and they've got this kind of boardwalk sidewalk that goes through it so that you don't, you know, wreck everything when you're walking through. You just kind of show up, check it out, and and leave. I'm and... having I'm having deja vu. Not that I've been there. I've been to something very, very similar in Wisconsin. Went to school in Wisconsin. Okay. And they had a boardwalk through twisted trees. Well, I mean, there's there's another one in Poland that's like that too. And I'm not sure, I don't know about the biology behind it, but there's, like I said, there's just perfectly normal trees 20 feet away from it. And then just all the ones in this particular area are fucking weird. <laughs> perfectly describes too. Yeah. <laughs> Quick Dick McDick wants to know what your favorite color is. I know he's being a smart ass, but I thought, you know what? Screw it. It's getting thrown in. Green. Green is the color, believe it or not. Green's a solid color. Law of fives. What ministerial, ministerial seat do you want in the new Buffalo Republic? Deregulation. Imagine if we had a minister of deregulation. That's what you want to do? Go around and deregulate? Why does, what is the government... I mean, we're not that far past when the government, when we decided that we didn't want the government telling us who we could and couldn't love, right? Why does the government, why does the government need to tell you and I how much we're willing to pay each other to work for each other? Why does the government need to have this and that? How many redundancies exist? Uh, when Harper took all that hell for getting rid of the federal oversight of fresh water in Canada, That was actually something that started before he became prime minister. So when the liberals were still in charge and it was a good thing because you had a provincial body that was already looking after the same thing. So they said, well, we can save some money if we just stop doing this. And so it's funny because Harper got a lot of hell for it, but it wasn't his thing and it wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. There's, there's so much red tape that there's some of it that's, that's necessary. I mean, I don't think you should just be able to just, make your own pipeline wherever you want. And there definitely needs to be oversight in a lot of different areas, but look at how much, look at how much stifling red tape there is in something like starting a brewery or an oil refinery. I mean, do you think it's weird that we ship all our unprocessed oil other places and then bring back gasoline? Right. I mean, there's, there's a little bit here and there. You guys have the upgrader and, you know, St. John has Irving oil and why, why is it so far fetched to think that we couldn't just build some more? Well, it's because there's so much red tape involved that the cost in front of it is so prohibitive that no company is going to try it. Let's fix that. Hmm. Well, this has been uh, a fantastic little uh, sit down. Good, sir. I appreciate you uh, hopping on. Um, Thanks for first- having me. Is this the first one you've done? This is the first guest podcast I've ever done. I've never done anything really like this. I got interviewed at a football game one time with my shirt off, and that's about the closest thing. <laughs> was it at Mosaic? <laughs> no, it was at McMahon. Uh, McMahon. The riders were in town playing, and there was a bunch of us tailgating, and 
maybe kind of funny story. So yeah, I'm there with my shirt off and the cops come by, they, they go by all this people with the Stampeders gear, give them tickets, give them tickets, come to, or pardon me, like go past them, go past them, go past them. And then, oh, there's riders fans, tickets for everybody, go past them, go past them, you know, and then oh, the next riders fan tickets for everybody. And so then somebody from the CBC radio of all places wanted to interview me and they were just like, Oh, what do you think about this? And, and I said, you know what? It's a little bit messed up because I thought in Canada, you weren't able to dip, the police weren't able to discriminate against people based on what color they are. <laughs> and then believe it or not, the CBC cut that out when they aired it. <laughs> of course they did. Uh, well, twos, it's been fantastic getting to sit with you, especially on your first time. I feel honored that you, you, uh, you uh, chose me to to be a guy who to sit around and have a bullshit with. Thanks, man. This was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. You know, we were talking about how I didn't know if I had all that much to say or what we could do with it. And it just, it flew by and it was pretty easy. And yeah, there was a few things that, yeah, I just, I loved it. Yeah. Well, thanks for hopping on. Thanks for having me, man. It's been great. It's nice to finally, it was, it was funny when I talked to you on the phone and then, you know, it's, it's weird to hear your voice talking to me, not just talking in a podcast. So that was kind of funny and interesting. And this whole thing has been great. Cool. Well, we'll have, in that case, we'll have to do it again. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. If you just stumbled on the show, please click subscribe, then scroll to the bottom and rate and leave a review. I promise it helps. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, we will have a new guest sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcast fix. Until next time. Hey, Keeners. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, episode. A shout out to Derek Nurnberg. He said, hey, Sean, love your podcast. Just getting into the Brady Leovold one. Um, uh, that was a good one. If you haven't gone back to Brady Leovold, uh, I suggest doing that. He said he, he uh, remembers refing him back in the dub. Like, hey, that's a cool story. Appreciate you guys reaching out. Now, it is Monday, so get to work. If you are the champ, I know you're thinking about those golf courses, but, dude, let's leave it till Friday. Let that hand heal up a little bit better, eh? All right, folks, we'll catch up to you Wednesday when I sit down with the bike for breakfast crew. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's coming up on Friday. And let me tell you, I'm pretty amped. We're only a few days away, and then... Start pedaling. Till then.